I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. This video contains adult language. Viewer discretion is advised. My name is Rick, and I'm a 22-year Army veteran. It was the greatest joy in my life being a soldier next to being a father of two. At the time, my MOS was 11B Infantry, and my specialty was Infantry Scout. I attended one station unit training at Fort Benning, Georgia, where I was taught the skills necessary to be an effective scout. I did deploy to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Bosnia, Kosovo, OEF, and OIF. In my heart, I know I served with integrity and honor, so it makes it a bit difficult for what I'm about to tell you, but on the eyes and souls of my children, it's the God-honest truth. I was based at Fort Bragg, North Carolina in 1996. I was with the HHQ Company, 1-505th PIR, and in 1996, we were going to be involved in a joint training exercise at Fort Lewis. While preparing all the equipment and other additional things needed to be done prior to leaving, I was informed that I was going to be the Op 4 leader. I had been the Op 4 a couple of times before, and I will admit that it was fun to do. I had several meetings with the Battalion S3 in charge of operations and plannings and others, and was given a long list of actions that the Op 4 would be doing. It was a surprise to be informed that we'll be let loose and engage the units however we wished, as long as it followed the planning schedule. Two of the missions had us as terrorists with a suicide bomb vest. We used brown cardboard tubes with paper rolls and toilet paper and painted them and glued them and taped them with wires to make them look real. In other missions, we were to penetrate the OA area of operation and plant bombs on vehicles next to crew tents and leave without being seen. The S3 would be informed via radio calls to the TOC. We were causing havoc everywhere and we were having a blast. We'd set up our campsite and get our rest near the areas where we were to do whatever the plan called for. On the night in question, we checked the map to see where the company would be attacking, since all locations were predetermined. Seeing where all the other units were on the map, I made the decision of where to bunk down and get a few hours of rest before we would go on with the mission at hand. We parked the Humvee as close as possible to the hill that I thought would be the best to keep us from being noticed and climbed up to the next hilltop. The next day's mission had us attacking on or about 5 a.m. The plan was to get up at 3 a.m. and I would take the 1 to 3 guard shift. It was close to midnight when we were awoken by small arms fire. Everyone involved in this training exercise carried blanks and all had red blank adapters attached to the end of the muzzle. There's a very distinct difference in the sound between live rounds and blank rounds. The firing was about 350 to 400 meters from our location on the opposite side of the hill where, according to our war map, no unit was to be. Within moments of the firing starting up, there was a very loud roar. I've heard lions roar, and this was much louder, and you could feel it. The guys and I were scared straight. The weapon fire lasted 30 seconds, give or take, and then quiet. Two of my soldiers were about to run down the hill to see what was going on, and I had to stop them. We gathered our M16s and night vision goggles and cautiously proceeded down the hill, going from tree to tree to hide. There were a few bright flashlights we could see as we approached. We were about 75 feet and could hear men talking, and one was on a radio when suddenly one of them shouted out, Movement up the hill! We got caught and we were told to reveal ourselves and approach. And that's where we saw them. In front of us lay two Sasquatch. The male was obviously dead, and the female was breathing heavily, spitting out and choking on her blood. The men there took our weapons and night vision goggles, and the one talking identified himself only as a captain. He was talking loudly and was pissed off that we were there. Much of what was said at first didn't relate to us because we were looking at the two Sasquatch. The male was sprawled on his back, with the light they had you could clearly see his penis. The female succumbed to her wounds, stopped breathing, and died. Me and the boys were in shock at what we were seeing. The captain who was talking to me gave me a slap in the face to get my attention to him. Once I did look at him and come out of the spell I was in, I noticed the smell coming from the creatures. I had identified to them who we were and why we were there. Once the shock wore off, I took a real close look at these men. Their equipment and weapons were not standard issue. I knew they were Delta Force because of the hockey helmets they were wearing. 
Five minutes after we were found out, a Humvee was heard approaching, and now a colonel came up and gave us an ash-chewing. We were moved down the hill, but before the Delta Force was prepping the Sasquatch for extraction, because a Black Hawk Hilo came in low and hovered above. We were put in other vehicles and taken away. We traveled like two hours until we arrived at a location. We were ushered into a room where we waited an hour. They had all our information, unit, and all our equipment. That colonel, other military officers, and that Delta Force captain came in and gave us direct orders not to speak of this matter, and that if it was discovered that we did, we'd be facing UCMJ action against us, and we do time at Leavenworth. They really put the fear of God in us. We were told that our battalion commander was informed of us interfering on their training mission, and we were to return to the TOC after we were debriefed. Since I was the only NCO of the group, I was threatened with having my career ruined if I ever spoke of this again. Some time later, we were loaded up on a five-ton truck under guard and driven back to the hill where all of this took place. We were allowed to gather our stuff from the hilltop and followed to the TOC's current location, and the truck following us just continued moving on down the road. We were given another ash-chewing by our battalion commander. Although he didn't say it, I got the distinct impression he knew what had happened. The S3 Major and others appeared after we got chewed out, and we were chewed out once again. As the old adage goes, shit rolls down the hill. For the final three days remaining at the FTX, we would do the ops for mission and have to return to the TOC afterwards. In 2000, I was based in Germany. I had gone to Würzburg to visit an army buddy based there, and while at the commissary, I saw one of the soldiers from our OP4 team. We talked, but what had happened at Fort Lewis was not brought up until I simply asked, Did you ever think about it? His face went pale, and he nodded. We left it at that. For years, it's eaten me up. I wanted to climb the roof of my house and shout it out loud, but the fear of reprisal from the army or the government kept me from doing so. I don't know why those Sasquatch were hunted and killed. I just remember her labored breathing and seeing tears rolling down her face as she died. There are several things that also that are not included in this letter to you, because it would be a book, more or less. I just wanted to state the most important things of this encounter. I just needed to get it out in the open, set myself free from this. It's been 26 years, and whatever happens, happens. On the night of September 10th, on the night of September 12th, 2012, I went home from Walmart in Spanaway, Washington, and I turned left on 8th Avenue East, which goes from Spanaway Highway 7, which is Pacific Avenue also. This street turns into a two-lane country road that makes one of the borders of Joint Base Lewis McCord. It was a long, dark two-lane country road that bisects a huge prairie with lots of old-growth woodlands bordering it. There are no mile markers nearby where I seen what I saw. The best I can do is it's approximately four to five miles out of town. The road is largely flat and straight, but there are a few rises as you drive. The place I was at was about three to four hundred feet from the second place where there's a rise on the road. I know this because I could see the creature with a hill in the background and some trees. First off, it was very dark and oddly devoid of cars as there's usually someone flashing their lights at me as my car has a headlight out and I've been driving with my brights on until payday to get it fixed. I think if I had not had my brights on, I would never have seen this creature. At any rate, suddenly I see the Patterson film in real life, about 400 feet down the road ahead of me. The creature I saw fit the same color scheme of Harry and the Hendersons, but in behavior it was nearly identical to the Patterson film. It strode across the road in three to four strides, and in as many was way off to the right again when it stopped in mid-stride and looked back at me, exactly like the Patterson film. But this thing looked huge, even from the distance I saw it. When you see something that does not fit into the ordinary part of what you perceive as your reality, your brain tries to pigeonhole that data into another file, and another, after another. Click, 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 and suddenly you come up with, does not compute. At first I thought it was a smudge on my windshield, but it was moving right along, just like the Patterson film. So, I went to work, and several people lived near me, and I decided to tell someone. One guy had a girlfriend who'd seen him within a mile of my home within a month ago, and then a week ago, 
His father came home at midnight, telling him he had seen one in the same area in the headlight of his Harley, where a small creek runs under the road and the creature appeared to be crossing the road where the bridge was. It's weird how this affects you. I could really see how someone could keep this to themselves for their entire lives. However, when I shared this story, I got, Oh yeah? This happened and that happened. To my cousin, my brother, my dad, and even a couple of personal stories from people who grew up here. I was always willing to keep an open mind, but the lack of physical evidence sort of left me wondering, if I had to be honest. Now I know we share our woods with one big bitch, and you better be paying attention when you're out cooking up that bacon at 8 p.m. in the woods around here, because I don't think he's gotten that big eating dandelion greens. My impression? One huge Chewbacca, Harry and the Hendersons kind of guy. At least two and a half to three feet thick through the chest from front to back and if I had to estimate, would be tall enough for a Sasquatch at 9 to 12 feet. Like I said, it was quite a ways up the road, but I had time to see it, evaluate and question and look again. And then again, after it looked at me again to the right, at me coming down the road. So, it was a pretty firm sighting, even if I'm still questioning myself the next day. Like I said, your brain tries to rationalize anything that does not compute. But I was not under the influence of anything and I'm still puzzling and marveling over it all. My urge to get in a last-minute camping trip just evaporated like a puff of smoke. We were going fishing on May 29, 2016. We turned right at the Roy Y going south. It was 5.15 a.m. We observed and exclaimed, that looks like an ape sitting on the side of the road. The animal was about three feet high in a sitting crouched position. We were going south from left to right. We saw its left arm shoulder to elbow, left leg hip to knee, lower leg obscured. The head was larger with a sagittal crest. Lantern-shaped jaw that protruded slightly forward. The nose looked wide, and it had a protruding eyebrow like a Neanderthal. Its ears were covered in black hair tight to the head. No visible neck. Still going left to right, we could clearly see shiny black hair. The animal leaned forward head going down low, and you could see the top of both black-haired ears. Our distance at this point is between 22 to 25 feet. The animal extends its right arm from the shoulder parallel to the ground and drops some trash from its hands. The arm had black hair all the way to the knuckles. The arm was too long to be human. When it dropped the trash, a thumb and forefinger were clearly visible. The animal moved its right arm back in front of its torso, 90 degrees of angle not a bear. It did this action twice. Still going left to right, the right arm from shoulder to elbow is visible below the right arm between right arm and right leg, right leg visible from top of buttocks to hip to knee, partially covered by a green plastic garbage bag. We estimate its overall height to be between 5 foot 6 inches to 6 feet tall. We said Mama Squatch would not leave baby that close to the road. As we lost sight of it, we knew it was a juvenile Bigfoot. A follow-up report was done June 27, 2016. The witness is a 63-year-old lifelong outdoorsman. He's very familiar with all the animals that are native to the Pacific Northwest. He has hunted and harvested deer, elk, and bear. He's very qualified to identify the animals that he sees in the woods. In this witness's case, he is additionally experienced with identifying Sasquatches as he has had sighting experiences that started when he was 15 years old. He retold the account of his sighting. His report narrative is very complete. His girlfriend said that she looked into the forest behind where the creature was and was able to see an adult standing there watching. The sighting was along one of the public roads that passed through Joint Base lewis McCord. He mentioned that he knew what it was at first sight because he had seen them several times during his lifetime. Here are accounts of his past three sightings. He was fishing one morning not far from the Killing Creek campground. There were sounds of birds and wildlife when suddenly it got very quiet. He heard what sounded like a person whistle twice to get his attention. He looked around and didn't see anything. Then he heard what sounded like someone hitting a log with a rock. He moved a little to get a better view, but couldn't see anybody, so he kept fishing. Then a shower of stones and gravel hit the water right in front of him. He looked around and he was not able to see what was throwing things at him. 
Then he saw a rock about half the size of a bowling ball come sailing in an arc and land in the middle of the creek. He saw the arm that threw it, and knew then where the rock thrower was. He saw it behind a large dead standing tree snag. He could see both shoulders, one on each side of the tree. He said it was so big it would make the old-time professional wrestler Haystack Calhoun look small. He could see it looking at him, peeking around the tree. Then it stepped out alongside of the tree. His first thought was, who is this big, naked pervert watching me? Then it dawned on him that it wasn't a person, it had to be a Sasquatch. He said that it was obviously a male. The face was human-looking, brown eyes, brown and black hair, hair on most of the face, square jaw, chin whiskers, small ears on the side of its head, sloping forehead, brow ridges, a flat nose with big nostrils, and a cone-shaped head. He could see the left arm hanging down almost to its knees, with the right arm still wrapped around the tree. The witness stood up and turned towards it, and as he did that, it made a quick inhale-exhale sound, which the witness did back at it. It then turned its whole body to the right and began to walk away. He said that he could see all the muscles move as it walked, its arm swing and the three-foot-wide butt and four-foot-wide shoulders. It was eight and a half to nine feet tall. It walked about 50 yards away and turned its whole body to the left and looked at him one more time, then walked off into the woods. The witness said to himself, this has to be a Sasquatch, as there's nothing else that it could be. The second sighting was at Tule Lake in South Pierce County. He was 18 years old. He was going duck hunting, so he took his rubber raft out to what they call the beaver house out in the middle of the lake. He'd been hunting all morning, and it was now around 10 a.m. He looked back towards the landing where people put in their boats as some ducks were flying there. He noticed a large brown-colored head going through the cattails. It looked like it was floating along above the cattails. Then it dawned on him that those cattails were seven to eight feet high, and this creature was a full head higher. He continued to watch it walk along, sometimes disappearing and sometimes visible enough to see an arm. Ducks would flush as it walked through the cattails. His attention was momentarily diverted to some ducks that were going to fly over. Then, when he looked back at the end of the cattails, he saw this massive brown animal down on all fours drinking water. The back legs looked like human legs, but they were pulled apart under the armpits. He thought, there is no bear around here that are that big. He took his shotgun and he fired a shot up into the air. As soon as he shot, the creature stood smoothly up and turned its body to look at him. The bank that was behind him was four and a half feet high. He knew because he had been over there. It was at 150 yards, and the bank came up to its hips. He could see clearly that it was a male. It was looking right at him. Although he was not moving, he believed that it could see him. Then it turned its whole body to the right so that its left side was facing him. It put its hand on top of the bank and with one foot stepped right on top of the bank. With that, the witness thought, a person cannot make that step. He said that he could see the calf muscles, tendons, and butt as it stepped straight up onto the top of the bank. He watched it walk away towards some Christmas tree-sized fir trees, which were about six to nine feet tall. He observed that most of the trees were under its chin, but some were higher. Then, a pickup truck was approaching on the road that parallels the lake. The creature turned, spotted the pickup truck, and dropped straight down. He could see it in a crouching position. After the pickup passed, it stood back up, looked in the direction that the truck had gone, and then walked out of sight into the woods. The witness said, I've got to see this. So he got into his raft and paddled over to the bank. He couldn't see footprints in the muddy water, but on top of the bank, he could see a massive handprint. The handprint was twice the size of his hand. He could also see impressions where it stepped with its left foot and then the right foot. He paddled back to the landing, got in his car, and drove around to where he thought it would have crossed the dirt road. He found an 18 to 24 inch place that looked like someone had taken a dust mop and slapped it down on the road. He found a footprint on the side of the road, one in the middle and one on the other side. The mud from its feet fell off the foot at each step. He judged that it was every bit of nine feet tall. The next sighting was his most cherished and significant sighting. He commented that he felt he was blessed to be able to have this sighting. It was 1972 or 1973, and he was about 21 years old. 
There were four of them camping up by Lake Cushman. Two were studying to be ministers. The other was with his girlfriend, who would become his wife. The first night, they heard screaming like a woman screaming, and then another high-pitched scream, and that was followed by another scream howl that was deeper in tone. They were trying to figure out what it was. They were discussing what animal it might be. Then a woman came up and said that she thought she had seen an ape up there earlier in the day. After further discussion, he decided that he would get up early in the morning, then go up the old road that went up the hill alongside the lake and try to see what was there. There was a gulch up there with a stream running down it, so he got up early in the morning and walked up that old road. As he walked quietly up the road to where the gulch was, he heard mumbling from below him as if someone was talking. He stood very still. He could tell that there were two, as he could hear branches breaking, footsteps, and the talking back and forth. He said that he could hear H sounds. He paralleled them slowly, watching down the hill, trying to see them. As the brush thinned out, he could see two blonde heads. One was small and one was big. He thought, blonde? The only color of blonde is a grizzly, and there are no grizzlies in this area. As they moved, when a branch broke, they would be still. He knew that this was no human, as a human always takes the next step, which is a dead giveaway. When they stopped, he would stop. He would still hear the mumbling. When he got to the place where the dark shadows of the trees were across the road ahead of him, he saw a huge black form cross the road and disappear. He said to himself, What was that? He kept creeping up the road and could still hear the mumbling. When he got to the place where there were three trees and a stump along the road, he sat down, looking over the edge of the bank. He could see there were huckleberry bushes below him. The slope was about 10%. He sat there very still and noticed a motion in the brush below him about 15 feet. He shifted only his eyes towards it and saw two large brown eyes looking at him. They were about 8 to 10 inches apart. It had brown skin on its nose and a couple of wrinkles. He saw the eyes flick over and look at him, and he sat very still. He saw the blonde hair, and it was massive, on all fours, foraging for berries. He just sat there watching. Then he sees the long blonde left arm reach out and grab a berry bush branch and strip the berries off with his mouth. The fingers were black. He realized that these were not gloves. He sat watching for a while, and as the sun got a little higher, he brought his hands up to shield his eyes so he could still see it. When he did that, he noticed 15 feet away was this little doll-like face looking at him, holding its hand above its eyes, just like he was doing. The little one was mimicking him. Eventually, the little one put its head back down. The witness said out loud in a friendly tone of voice, I see you. It popped its head back up to look at him, and it looked and looked at him. Then the adult looked over towards him, too. He avoided making direct eye contact. Most of the time, they were out of sight down low in the brush, but he could see the heads from time to time. He noticed that they would very soon reach a place where the brush opened up, so he would be able to cut them off and see them clearly. So he slowly crept over to his right. When he kneeled back down, looking over the edge, he suddenly heard to his right a crashing sound as a six to eight foot diameter tree broke and was slammed to the ground. He looked that way to see another huge black thing, about eight feet tall, walking up the hill away from him. He stood up to get a better look, and as he did, out of the corner of his eye to the left, he saw the blonde one take about ten steps down the hill. It stopped, quartering towards him. He could see a seven and a half foot tall Sasquatch with large breasts, blonde, black hands and black hair in the genital area looking at him. He said that she would put Dolly Parton to shame. He said to himself, this is a female Sasquatch. Then he asked himself, where's the little one? So he looked down and still right close by, he said it turned towards the female with its arms outstretched to its sides and ran down the hillside. It was about four feet tall. It ran right into a stump and vaulted over it and then ran down and hid behind its mum. It then peeked out and looked at him, so he said, I see you, in a friendly and playful tone. It then looked up at its mum, who made a vocalization towards it, and then they both turned away and walked down the hill. So he walked back to camp. The people there asked him, Well, did you see anything? He said, Yes, but you wouldn't believe me if I told you.
In telling of his encounter, he had made reference to the H sounds that he had heard. The witness said that it was something like hick or hiss, and some others that to him were almost like words, but they were garbled sounds, and he couldn't make out what it was. It was obvious to him the mum and baby were talking to each other. The witness has had several other encounters since then, while hunting mostly. He spends a lot of time in the forest, both hunting and fishing. He is kind, calm, and unafraid. He presents no threat. And the Sasquatch seemed to be able to sense those qualities in individuals. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.